Thank you, Tommy. Um, being last, I will follow a lesson which Tommy taught me, <laughs> which is that if you're making a speech, just make three points. <laughs> so I'm going to quickly make three points. After that, you all can relax. <laughs> the first point is that dense, open, integrated, well-connected, well-planned cities are the greenest and the most sustainable way of life for the future. I'll explain that later. The second point is that the quality of the environment is the source of enduring competitive advantage. Money, ideas, people are mobile. But whether or not you can have a blue sky, clear, safe drinking water, and clean streets is something which you can't create overnight, and is something which, once achieved, gives you an edge. And I'll elaborate that using Singapore as an example later on. My third point is to beware of subsidizing consumption. Instead, what governments need to do is to invest in infrastructure. And the key is good governance, having honest, competent, public authorities capable of envisioning the future, inducting the latest technology, working with a competitive private sector to not only build infrastructure, but the point I want to emphasize is also the need to be able to maintain and renew that infrastructure. And that really is a key point. So let me now use Singapore as a case example to illustrate these three points. First, we are very, very small, but we are a city. We are a city-state. We know that globally, half of humanity now lives in cities, and by 2050, 80% of all human beings will live in cities. Why is that so? They don't live in cities because it's government policy to live in cities. They come because they're voting with their feet. Why? Because cities are a focal point for opportunities, for jobs, for cultural capital, for social capital. But most important, it's about opportunities. And the key issue as humanity congregates in cities is going to be housing. You've heard examples of slums. Well, we don't have slums in Singapore. Why? Because we have provided subsidized public housing. But the real genius of public housing in Singapore is the fact that 90% of people do not rent these premises, but are owners of the premises, and therefore have a stake in a real asset, and therefore maintain their homes for the long term. The second point on the environment being a source of enduring competitive advantage, we are now sitting on reclaimed land. This took 30 to 40 years to envision, to implement, and to execute. If you look outside now at the waters around us, this used to be an open sewer. But in 10 years, we converted an open sewer into a river which would supply fresh water into Marina Bay. Everything which you see around Marina Bay now has been developed, really built only in the last five, five years. Why do we do that? Because we showcase that it is possible to build, to invest for the long term, and to provide for our people as well as our guests and our investors a place where you will have blue skies, clean, safe water, and clean streets. You see, the point is, if I can provide an environment where you would trust your wife and your children to live in, this is also precisely the same place where you would be prepared to leave your money with for safekeeping, to invest for the long term, and to use as your regional or even global headquarters. So there is actually a logic to that. The third point, before I run out of time, is to avoid subsidizing consumption. Now, in the case of Singapore, we import everything that we eat, half our water, and 
almost all our energy. I say almost because 1% of our energy comes from incinerating our waste. <laughs> but in such a resource-constrained society, we don't subsidize energy. We don't subsidize water. In fact, we don't subsidize any consumption items. But we ensure that we give cold hard cash to those members of our society who may be less well off. They then decide on very rational grounds how to use their own hard earned income plus the cold hard cash that the government has supplemented it with to consume water, food, transport, and all the other essentials of life. But the point of achieving that is not only to ensure social equity and opportunity, but also because a market signal exists, and it makes it worth the while for companies like Siemens to consider long-term investments in this place, because you know that we are good for our money, we will pay for the latest and the best, and we will continue to renew our infrastructure and maintain it in tip-top condition. So the point is that we create opportunities for the private sector, we create a test bit for new research and technological breakthroughs which emanate in universities and laboratories, and then we create a working model of the future. So that's really what Singapore is. So mm -hmm. you're all of a place which has been developed, but I also would challenge you to find the oldest places in Singapore and look for places where we may have lapsed. And I would, chat, I would put to you that in fact, actually we're doing a not a bad job in maintaining, in renewing, and making sure that this is a working model of the future. So let me just conclude by saying that we have tried to use Singapore to illustrate these three points that the future for humanity is in cities, and cities can be the most sustainable way of life for humanity in the century to come. Secondly, there is competition between cities, and a key enduring source of advantage is how well you maintain your environment. And third, it is possible to achieve social equity and business logic to join the dots between technology commercial interests, and social and political objectives. And that really is the secret behind the Singapore that you see today. So thank you all very much for your presence in this audience. Thank you. <laughs>